So our, our, final, um, our final discussion here um, will be done remotely as well. We have Anant Agarwal on the line. Um, again, you can read about him in your bio packets here, but he is the, um, the, uh, the head of edX, which is a massive open online course, uh, uh, really one of the pioneers in this whole, uh, in this whole area, created as a collaboration between uh, Harvard and Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT. And he's going to talk a little bit about uh, where we're going in trying to use MOOCs to improve healthcare. And I can't help but, you know, just to preface this, listen to this comment that the concept that Twitter and Facebook can change the world, there's a little part in between you actually tweeting and the world changing um, that is also important to do. And this is sort of, there's a whole process of education that's going to go in there. Uh, so I think that this is going to uh, address some of that. And it sort of epitomizes, um, I think the line I once heard is like, I wanted to fly, I, you know, I, I thought we'd be blasting off spaceships to, the, to Mars, and instead we just got 140 characters. So uh, this is sort of, uh, you know, uh, filling in that gap between um, just wanting to be interested in something and actually having the knowledge and tools to make a difference and how we're going to get there. Thank you for joining us, Anant. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, you know, my pleasure. Uh, it's really, really interesting that you say uh, technology can do so much. It's unbelievable. And uh, yet, all people are able to get is uh, 140 characters. Uh, it, is, uh, it is pretty tragic. And, and one of the things we are trying to do is, you know, really try to use technology both to increase access uh, to education for students around the world, and at the same time, also try to improve the quality of education uh, as we offer it uh, as well. So, so should I just dive right into uh, uh, making some comments? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, let me go ahead. Yes. So, uh, so what you see here is uh, that this is not a rock concert. Uh, this is uh, actually the Obafemi Owolowo uh, University, and this is a classroom in that university in uh, in Nigeria. And uh, we've all heard of. Uh, distance education, but if you're sitting away in the back in this lecture hall, so to speak, you know, but this is uh, long distance education. And, uh, you know, it's quite likely that um, each one of those students uh, likely has a smartphone or a cell phone uh, and can do 140 characters. And the question is, how do we really use technology to, to provide education and quality content to uh, a large part of the population around the world? Uh, and public health is certainly one of those key areas that, uh, that uh, we focused on in many, many of our courses that I'll talk about today. So edX is a, uh, a non-profit venture. Um, edX.org is a learning destination where you can go and uh, take uh, just great free courses from some of the best universities in the world. Um, you know, our mission is to increase access to education. Uh, we want to improve campus education. And we want to advance research as we collect all of this data on the platform where people can uh, study how students learn using the, uh, the data. So one reason why MOOCs have uh, really caught the attention of uh, the people around the world is the sheer numbers. So just as one example, in the first course on edX, which uh, uh, my colleagues and I taught, and this was a hard MIT course in circuits and electronics, um, we had, believe it or not, 155,000 students uh, take the course from 162 countries. And this is a, uh, this is a really big number uh, in terms of public health. Um, our first public health course was uh, PH207X from, uh, from Harvard. And uh, this public health course as well had uh, a huge number of students taking it. Uh, about 65,000 students uh, took this public health course in the fall of 2012 from uh, all over the world. And what was amazing about this course is that, uh, surprisingly, uh, the average number uh, in terms of gender distribution, uh, the average number of women that seem to take uh, a lot of these courses is about 25% uh, to 30%. But if you look at the uh, public health course from, uh, from, uh, from Harvard, uh, the interest in the public health course was uh, incredibly uniform across uh, genders. And 44% uh, you know, of, uh, of women uh, the female uh, students were uh, 44 percent, a much larger number. And again, strong interest from all over the world, um, huge interest from many of the uh, developing countries. Uh, usually India uh, tends to be about uh, a third 
of the U.S. population in our courses, but for the public health course, um, India was uh, about 50% uh, of the U.S. learners on our platform. And one of the reasons for that was uh, there's the AMA, I think it's the uh, one of the medical associations both in the U.S. and also one in India, uh, that uh, tweeted heavily about this course and got all the doctors to sign up for the course. So uh, one of the other interesting impacts of uh, teaching MOOCs and public health is that the public health course from Harvard uh, was in epidemiology and biostatistics. Uh, they were able to have students do global experiments around the world and, uh, you know, they did statistical uh, analysis of the data. So, for example, <laughs> one of the funny things they looked at was, uh, I think it's funny, was, uh, you know, when, when you shower, uh, they were looking to find out, you know, do you face the shower or do you uh, uh, face the other way when you sh uh, shower? And what was interesting was they did this test all around the world uh, as part of the course and they had the students in the course be part of the study. And what they found was that uh, uh, there was a very strong gender bias in, uh, in whether you face the shower or not, uh, you know, depending on, uh, and it didn't matter which country you came from. So, you know, very interesting uh, correlation between public health research and also uh, MOOCs. So, to give you a quick uh, sense of edX, you know, we have uh, close to 2 million learners from uh, every single uh, country in the world today. Um, we keep adding courses on every week. Uh, this presentation is already uh, two weeks old. Uh, we are close to, uh, uh, we add about 150 courses on edX in, uh, in uh, virtually all subjects, medicine, public health, of course, uh, law, business, sciences, mathematics, engineering, and so on. The way we work is that we have uh, a number of great institutions from around the world that partner with edX and offer uh, their courses on edX and, you know, see examples in addition to Harvard and MIT, a place like uh, Dartmouth or, or University of Texas, Austin, or Wellesley College, you know, liberal arts colleges, IIT Bombay, Tsinghua, from, uh, from the east. And, uh, you know, but today we have close to 150 courses and, uh, and uh, a really a rich set of courses in, uh, in a large number of disciplines. So if you go to edX.org, you know, you can take these free courses uh, online. Uh, we're also working on credentialing and, uh, and providing a way for students to showcase what they've learned. So uh, the students can take these courses uh, for audit. Uh, they can also take it to get a certificate, um, an honor code certificate. Uh, they can also sign up to get a verified certificate, um, and for the verified certificates, they pay a small fee on the order of $25 to $50. Now, we've also launched X series, uh, which are sequences of courses in a given discipline, and, you know, I look forward to, in the next few months, uh, getting on board um, a public health sequence of courses that people can take to, uh, to really get uh, uh, something like a minor or a program within uh, public health. Um, one of the things we did as edX was we open sourced our platform, you know, as a nonprofit. Uh, we really wanted to open up not just free courses, but we make, made available a platform as well um, as open source. And we've seen broad adoption of the platform around the world as we, as we did this. So uh, uh, China launched Shuetang X, which is a, a Chinese national platform. France launched FUN, France University de Numerique. Uh, the Middle East did the same. Uh, Stanford has also adopted our platform and have become great collaborators. Um, if you go to online uh, class.stanford.edu, again, the platform is based on Open edX. And uh, about a month ago, most recently, uh, we partnered with uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, you know, the Davos people. Uh, they've launched Forum Academy, where they'll be offering a number of courses. Um, and I think uh, the Forum Academy courses will be very interesting to the, uh, uh, to the world as we look at uh, issues facing developing countries and issues facing the Middle East and, and uh, technology's impact on people's lives and uh, things like that. Um, I want to give you a quick sense of what an edX course looks like. Uh, you know, of course, you can go on uh, edX.org and uh, check out our demo course, Demo 101 yourselves. But uh, in, in, in online courses, we replace lectures with what are called learning sequences. A learning sequence is an interleaved sequence of uh, videos and interactive uh, exercises. So uh, in the screen here, you see this uh, ribbon uh, that shows uh, a number of uh, videos and interleaved exercises. So students can pause them and rewind them and so on. 
And then uh, after they watch the video, they can do an exercise to check what they've learned. Um, now this kind of learning you know, promotes a form of learning called active learning, which can be very helpful to the student because they are engaging with the material by answering questions as they go along. We're also able to grade the students automatically, um, whether it's a statistics course or you know it's a chemistry course or the equations and other forms. So we can provide instant feedback uh, to hundreds of thousands of students without having to manually grade uh, uh, the responses of the student. So I'll show you a quick little video. I hope that works through uh, WebEx of a student answering a uh, uh, a uh, a chemistry question uh, where the response is a chemical equation and they get instant feedback. So let's see if this uh, works out. Okay, it looks like uh, uh, looks like I guess the video doesn't play uh, here. Uh, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it should have been. Um, you know, the student would enter an equation here. I guess you don't even see my mouse here, so uh, uh, there's technology for you. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, they answer the question, and uh, if they get it right, they get a little green check mark. If they get it wrong, they get a little red uh, X. And uh, you know, these green check marks have become uh, a real cult symbol that edX and learners are telling us that, that you know they go to bed at night. You know, dreaming of the green <laughs> check mark has become a real, uh, you know, exciting part. And since I couldn't could not show you the demo, uh, you know, you really have to go to uh, edX.org and check out the demo course and try out some of the problems yourself and get the green check mark for yourself. Uh, you know, the green check mark has become uh, somewhat of a meme, um, and it's reached meme status on the web. And you know, but you know that as a technologist, you know you've arrived when something you've touched, uh, you know, results in uh, meme status. Oh, I, I guess this other fly file won't play as well. So I had another demo here where, where uh, you know, you ask the question, how do you do on labs? You know, whether it's uh, uh, chemistry or biology or, or any other subject, how do you do online labs? And, and uh, you know, labs are a challenge, but what we've done at edX very uniquely is uh, we use a lot of simulation technology to produce online laboratories in a number of subjects. And uh, I don't think this one will work either. Uh, but here I was going to show you a simulation for the course Science of Cooking by Harvard, where the, the student picks uh, a, a cut of meat, whether it's tuna or steak or whatever, and then they decide how to cook it, and they click on it, and they simulate cooking. And uh, it's a lot of fun, and then they can play around with the cut of meat and look at what's cooked and not cooked and, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, my apologies that the video uh, wasn't able to work uh, online here. Uh, we also have a discussion forum on the platform where students learn from each other and uh, ask each other's questions as they go along. And this is how uh, the questions get answered, and you can support uh, you know, millions of students on a platform taking a variety of, uh, of courses. We've also worked with a number of campuses. So, uh, of course, you can take these MOOC courses where you can take them uh, online, uh, but we're also working with a lot of campuses where we're trying to help improve the quality of education on campus and uh, create the blended model of learning. So here you see a classroom of one of our partners, San Jose State University, where uh, they took an edX course from MIT and they blended the classroom. So what does it mean to blend the classroom? Well, what it means is that the students watch videos and do the interactive exercises in the labs before they come to class. And then in class, uh, they sit down and uh, either have discussions among themselves or work with a professor and so uh, really bring the best of in-person and online. And some of the results have been pretty amazing in the blended model. So for, at the San Jose experiment, for the online class, traditionally, the failure rate for this campus course was 41%, while with the blended class, the failure rate for the same class, same exams, fell down to 9%. So it looks extremely, uh, extremely, extremely uh, promising. So let me stop there. And, uh, and, uh, and I guess uh, we have some time at the end for, for questions, so let me pause and uh, you know, pass it on uh, back to you. Thanks very much, Anant. That was, very, that was really a terrific introduction to the edX platform and the promise of MOOC-based uh, learning in general. I'm going to just take a few minutes and describe sort of the phase two of what we at Brookings here are trying to do in this area. And then we'll have a few minutes for questions with Anant, and then we'll uh, go ahead and uh, have our concluding remarks. Um, 
So here, um, we believe that this notion of massive open online courses holds a lot of promise. Through the Khan Academy partnership, we're really focusing on the basics. Do you know the simple uh, kind of facts regarding Medicare, Medicaid, what is payment delivery reform, and so forth? That really just gives you the fundamentals. And now we want to also now educate clinicians about how exactly do you do this thing? If you want to change your day-to-day -day practice, actually change that encounter at that patient level we've talked about as being so important, how do you get the tools to do that? And this is what we're going to talk about now. So when we talk about healthcare delivery reform, we often see this diagram. Uh, this, um, like uh, many people, um, as uh, Richard Besser would say, immediately alienates a core group of the people we're trying to reach. You know, we're trying to go uh, to changing organization and payment models. And so the fundamental issue we have is how do we reframe this in a way that resonates with clinicians in particular? So we, we think, um, just as everything else, people respond to narratives and stories. There's a reason business schools use a case study method to teach. We don't do that as much in medical care when we talk about delivery reform. We use case studies all the time when we talk about clinical problems because we know that's how people think. And yet when we talk about delivery system reform, for some reason we forget that. We'd like to come back to that. We know that actually works. And so what we're going to do is really essentially use real clinical problems and stories from a wide variety of specialties and settings. Uh, we're looking at, at, uh, um, at one in particular, and I'll outline how we've started with that. But the key thing I also want to impart is that through these series of cases, we will explore bundled payments, shared savings, medical homes, community provider partnerships, and so on, but in a way that actually gives people the granular information to make a difference in their daily lives. So this is our first case study, which has already, uh, already moved along. Uh, it's redesigning care and payments for patients with congestive heart failure, analyzing the barriers to innovation. Uh, our team uh, here has started with this simple concept. Let's tell a story about this. This is how people think. It's how people learn. It's what resonates with people. Congestive heart failure is a fairly uh, complex problem. Um, it's one where the heart muscle gets sick, but what happens to patients? You can't breathe when you walk down the street. You stay home. You can't eat what you want. If you go and have something that you really enjoy, that may have a lot of sodium in it. You have a lot of shortness of breath. It really affects your day-to-day -day life in a way which is profound and is a chronic problem. It's a daily battle to feel better. And many, many clinicians also struggle with that. We don't know how to best take care of these patients. They come to the emergency room, you give them medicine, they go home, they still don't feel well, they come right back. We need to think of new ways to take care of this problem. And one of the levers we have sitting in health policy shops is changing how we pay for it. But then how do we link the ways in which we change payment to actually changing their lives? Where is that happening? Well, it happens in medical centers, it happens in doctor's offices, and so our team recently went to Duke University where we tried to profile how exactly is the policy in Washington, the policy from the payers, going to what are called accountable care organizations, thinking about trying to get people to sign for bundled payments, is that in fact resulting in better care at the level of the patient? What are the barriers to that happening? And what they're doing at Duke University, how does that compare to another site that we chose, University of Colorado, Denver? And it's fascinating how different people, when you really look at how they cope with this, they do it very differently. So Duke University, they are engaged in a very high level of high-tech care. They're concerned about how do we make sure that people get these VADs or devices that keep your heart beating. They believe that their patients are very sick compared to uh, other areas of the country. They think their patients have more substance abuse problems. That's what they focus on. University of Colorado says, we're more interested in actually just improving function of patients when they're at home. We want to make sure they know that they should take their medicines. We want to have nurse practitioners reach out to them very regularly. In effect, what's happening is these experiments are occurring across the country, and we want to document and understand how those are going and why people choose choose certain ways in which to structure their care. In addition to that, Duke University chose to go to the model of what's called a shared savings model. And if you look at our con tutorials, we'll explain what that is. 
University of Colorado is very different. They enrolled in what's called the Bundled Payment Care Initiative, or BPCI pilot. They went a totally different way. Again, both of those might get us to the same place, which is we want to improve care, but we're going to try to explain how those decisions are made. How do you do that? It's not just, we, it's, this isn't just about what Duke is doing or what University of Colorado is doing. It's about how do you do the same thing? And not even if you're a cardiologist. What if you're taking care of people with cancer, people with, um, who have asthma, people who have all kinds of other problems? What are the lessons you can learn? And this is sort of the strategy we're going to use. This is some of the innovations that we've seen at University of Colorado, electronic medical records. But the key thing we keep coming back to is we believe that all of this type of payment work must be filtered through a clinician who knows the patient, is familiar with the clinical problem, and we need clinician-based leadership. That is the nut that we're trying to crack with this by doing these case studies, by opening this up. We will not have all the answers, but as we say, we hope you'll at least be confused on a higher level than you are now. So, um, so I'll just summarize what we'll do here. What we're going to produce is, um, is ultimately, you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with MOOCs? You know, you're describing case-based study. The concept is that once this is done, we'll produce a paper, which is written, again, in a case study format, but then we'll present it and record it at our first event, which is planned for April. This will be a narrative event, starting with a patient. We're going to have people from those medical centers talk about how did you make these decisions? How did you do the financial analytics? What did your administrator say? What was sort of that experience like to sort of open that up? Then we will record it, and then we're going to create a MOOC. Uh, so something like, we want a classroom to look like this. It may not be real, but it'll be virtual. There may not be millions of people, but even if there's several physicians, hundreds of physicians, maybe thousands, they at least may learn the tools that they can then have so they, in their own lives, cannot feel hamstrung by policymakers, but feel that they have an investment in making care better. Uh, so uh, I will uh, end with that. and. Uh, um, we're already a little bit over time, but I know Anant has a ton to add, and hopefully have some time for questions. But I'll just give a quick preview that it, this we've talked about congestive heart failure. We are now moving on, and our next cases most likely will be in oncology as well as in asthma. So those are the kinds of areas we'll be moving through, again, because each of those have very different types of problems, and we're going to explore those, and hopefully you'll join us as we go through and do that. So I'll uh, end with this and see if we can get uh, Anant back up on the screen for a few questions. Terrific. Anant, can you hear me? Hopefully I'll be back in just a minute. But in the meantime, um, why don't we um, see if we have any questions coming in. I'll see if uh, we have anything coming in on Twitter as well. Hi, uh, Bruce Hamry from Geisinger. Um, excellent, and I understand the push to the universities for the MOOGs. Yes. What I don't understand, uh, out in um, the rest of the country, many people will discount what goes on at a university hospital mm -hmm. because the resources are different. There are uh, residents and fellows and all that. And I wonder if you've thought about going to some, there are a number of hospitals around the country uh, I know some in Illinois and other, other places that have done excellent jobs, for example, with CHF, um, and, and using uh, or adding to some of these, those examples, mm -hmm. which would perhaps be more generalizable to physicians out in the more typical private practice yes. communities. So Anand, I don't know if you could hear that question, but this gets at the broader theme of how do you take things that are applicable to university-based or by extension high resource settings or ones uh, and make them uh, accessible to people who are in very different areas? And how do you make sure that education or that outreach appeals to a much wider variety of uh, students? A great question. Uh, Darshak, can you hear me? Yes, we can all hear you. Perfect. Uh, I'm glad that works. So, uh, you know, excellent, uh, excellent question. Um, clearly, with uh, MOOCs and uh, widespread online learning, uh, we have to be able to uh, provide access to uh, learners all around the world where the resources available uh, can be quite varied and different. So, uh, what is becoming more and more common is that, uh, you know, people may not have a square meal, 
but uh, they will have a smartphone. Uh, you know, it turns out uh, I've heard statistics about only 20% of the children in many many African countries have access to a school, while the numbers that have access to uh, a smartphone are three to four times that number. Right, that and I think by extension, the question here, the question that was asked, I, I you may not, have, I, I didn't articulate it fully, was then at least in the healthcare system here, if the lessons that are being learned are from, say, large academic centers that have a very particular way of practicing, can those same lessons be applied to areas that are very different, potentially different community, hospital settings, and others? And my answer is that I think that what Anant is mentioning is that each although those settings seem very different, the basic tools that are still available ideally should be transferable. Um, and in addition to that, what we hope to do is, although our initial case studies focused on these two academic centers, the future ones, of course, will not be all at massive uh, areas you know, that have that. But we really hope to hit all those areas. So thank you for the question. You know, to, uh, to add very quickly to that, uh, a number of our partners are also universities around the world, not necessarily big academic centers in the uh, United States, but uh, a number of universities, in, uh, whether, it, whether they are in uh, you know, China, India, or you know, Africa, and so on, we're really expanding our membership, and uh, our hope is that there'll be a lot more of these grassroots courses um, that will come online, and by making a platform available to everybody as open source, we are seeing adoption of the platform across countries like the Middle East. And there, we'll see a lot more localized courses uh, begin to pop up on, uh, and available online. So, um, I, I'll let Elizabeth, and then it looks like we have a question on Twitter as well. Great, thanks. Um, the question I have about MOOCs is, one of the problems to me with medical information in this country is, and across the world, is. Um, is it often comes from people with a financial interest in that, in the outcome. So, I, and you know, I understand that MOOCs are nonprofit, but likewise, some of our big medical centers are nonprofit, yet they stand to profit by people doing more medicine, by having more procedures. So what's the business model going forward for you or for Khan Academy? Are there gonna be, you know, if we see, you know, health, uh, you know, pharma advertisers everywhere, are you really going to have an independent platform where people can go for information? Again, yeah. another, uh, another great question. I want to make clear that, uh, you know, both the Khan Academy and edX are uh, uh, non-profits, uh, and uh, we are, uh, you know, we work uh, in, in many ways together. Um, the other MOOC providers are all for profits. So uh, I think the point that you raise is even more significant with the for-profit uh, MOOC providers. So with the edX in particular, as, as a non-profit, uh, some of the business models we're looking at, uh, we'll, we'll certainly try to steer clear of some of the big, uh, you know, the usual types of, um, you know, abuses that you might see with, uh, with big centers. And uh, one of the things we're looking at um, in terms of uh, revenue models is uh, where students pay a small fee for a verified certificate. I showed you examples of certificates so where the users themselves can take the free course, but by paying a small fee, uh, they can get a verified certificate. Uh, initially, the fee right now is about uh, 25 to $100, which can still be expensive in uh, some parts of the world. And so there, over time, we're looking to find a way to charge for certificates by maybe, maybe pegging to uh, per capita and so on. So, so looking for ways to, uh, to be self-sustaining. And, uh, and in our case, as a nonprofit, we just have to sustain ourselves. We're not looking to uh, you know, go, uh, do an IPO or, or, or anything like that. Right. But I think the, the, at least the way I take this away is that when we talk about making healthcare quality better, many people say, how do we make it cheaper? or you know, those two things go hand in hand. And obviously, somebody's waste is another person's income, and how do we actually make that better? Um, and I think that the way to do that is to try and identify who is it that stands to benefit the most, and how can we then have that person become the major supporter of the kind of work we do? And there's certainly ways we can talk about it. 
I think that we are unfortunately out of time, um, but uh, hopefully the panelists um, can stick around a little bit afterwards. We're just going to summarize um, uh, quickly um, uh, with uh, with a few comments and um, and then uh, and then close for the day. So I'll uh, like to introduce. Um, we'll have a uh, uh, Alice Rivlin, who's a uh, now the director of the Engelberg Center. Um, for many of you, she needs no introduction, but again, a lot of information in the packet about her. Uh, but I'll like to invite Alice up for her comments.